Some of you may not remember this, but back in 2004, early 2004, people were already really antsy about the direction our country was headed. <clears throat> President Bush was already disliked. His favor favorability ratings were, were not very, very good. Uh, the American people were already unhappy with the direction of the war in Iraq. And they weren't happy with the direction our country was headed. Yet despite having every advantage on the issues, it wasn't enough for Democrats to win that election. Democrats really, in 2004, had hit rock bottom. Republicans celebrated. Republican House Majority Leader uh, Tom DeLay, you know, so exciting, he was bragging. He said, he boasted, if 1994 was the year we stopped thinking like a permanent minority, 2004 is the year we start thinking like a permanent majority. Unified, aggressive, rightfully confident of victory. Democrats, for their part, acted like beaten puppies, convinced that this was truly a conservative nation. Remember, this is four years ago. There was no fight in the Democratic Party. On issues like Iraq, our constitutional rights, Democrats would preemptively, preemptively surrender on every one of those issues. Like battered spouses, he kept thinking that their constant capitulation would inoculate them in future elections, that Republicans would lay off them, that Republicans would not criticize them. But that strategy clearly was a proven failure, shown to be a proven failure time and time again. And as the calendar turned to 2005, Democrats were already eager to assist right-wing efforts to destroy Social Security. They were calling it compromise. But the Republican trifecta in charge of our country had no interest whatsoever in ceding anything to the Democratic minority. And why should they? Democrats would inevitably cave in under the slightest pressure. But if Democrats were busy plotting their next surrender, political insurgents like me were plotting our counterattack. The focus wasn't even on Republicans at that time, but on our own party, on the Democratic Party, because no matter how much we wanted to change our country, we'd get nowhere until we changed the way our party did business. I was perhaps an unlikely person to be sort of at the forefront of this new movement. I was born in Chicago to immigrant parents. My mother was from El Salvador. My father was from Greece. They both struggled, and when I was four, and my brother was newborn, they decided to move back to El Salvador so they could have help from the family in raising their kids. I spent the next five years in El Salvador until in 1980, that nation's civil war forced my family back to the United States. They packed everything they owned into a Rambler station wagon, drove north to Chicago. We lost most of our belongings as soon as we crossed the border into Texas, uh, outside of the motel. Got up the next morning, everything was gone. It's actually my mother's birthday. But we made it back to the Chicago area safely, and eventually we settled in Schaumburg, which was really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not offending anybody, but it makes me have changed since 1980. But at the time, it was a really, really white place. I didn't speak English. I was short. I was skinny, and like today, I looked a lot younger than my actual age. I was a bully magnet. I was a nerd. And worse than all of that, I was a Republican. <laughs> but even back then, I loved politics. I used to think that I'd someday want to run for office. And being a military hawk, somebody who supported all of Ronald Reagan's wars, I had a silly and quaint notion that if I'd ever be in a position to send men or women to, uh, to fight, and to combat, that I would be a hypocrite if I myself did not put myself in that position. Like I said, it was a very quaint notion, because now I know, but I didn't know then, that Republicans don't share that. <laughs> Which is why I was destined, ultimately, to upgrade to the better party. <laughs> so off I went to the United States Army, served three years, First in Oklahoma, then in Bavaria, Germany. This was during the Gulf War between 1989 and 1992. I always said that the best decision I ever made was to join the Army, and that the second best decision I've ever made 
was to get out of the army. And it was. I went into the army, a broken 17-year-old, an emerging self-confident man. I had shoveled more shit in three years in the army than I knew I would ever face in the real world. Any of you who have served would know that that is actually a very important and useful life skill. Because no matter how bad things get, things could always be worse. I also developed a keen sense of duty to my fellow man. Those who were combat boots looked out after each other. We took responsibility for each other. And that is how I wanted to live my life. Yet immediately upon returning to the United States, I was struck by the selfishness and disdain for community exhibited by the Republican Party. As such, I could no longer be a Republican. In 1992, I voted for George Bush, but that was the last gasp, a dying reflex of a person I used to be. By 1996, my transition was complete. But so what? There I was, a newly minted Democrat, but truly an inconsequential one. I got an education at a nondescript public school, Northern Illinois University, right here in the Calc. No elite education like Northwestern for the likes of me. I attended law school at Boston University, ended up in California with a new wife, working a good but unremarkable job. People like me could spend hours talking about politics, but in the end, it really mattered little. As much as I wanted to play a bigger role in a democracy, those doors would never open for me. I didn't have the money to buy my way in, and I didn't have the pedigree to get an invitation. So I was left with a couple of unpalatable options. I could lick stamps in a dingy campaign office. I could watch a 30-second television spot. I could vote. That was it. Those were my choices, if I wanted to be involved. It, like so many others, I was unsatisfied with being a passive consumer. So I started Daily Toast. That was just one cog of a new people-powered machine that geared up to challenge the existing political status quo. There was many others like me. Thousands of blogs were launched. Move On exploded in size and became a political powerhouse. Regular Americans got involved in, for the first time on behalf of grassroots campaigns like Howard Dean's and Wesley Clark's. And while Dean and Clark fizzled, and while the media and political establishments mocked our failure, we kept organizing. We got Howard Dean elected chairman of the Democratic Party, which got even more people laughing. Republicans were gleeful. A spokesman for House Republicans, House, a spokesman for House Republicans declared, I can think of nothing better for the long-term prosperity of the Republican Party than to have the DNX come to Washington. His counterpart in the Republican Senate also laughed. He said, you have Barbara Boxer, Ted Kennedy, and now Howard Dean coming to the forefront as spokespeople for their party. You can't get much more far left than that. And a lot of Democrats started along. That was almost a problem. You expect Republicans to be, to say these sort of things, but a lot of Democrats were also afraid of Howard Dean. They were afraid of these new people power activists that were infusing the party with a lot of energy. They were afraid that we would doom their party. We sure adopted the hysteria on our side, the mocking on theirs, and set our first sights on saving Social Security, a battle we would ultimately win in 2005. This rare taste of victory galvanized Democrats and the public responded. Bush's, Bush's ratings hit the floor, and public sentiment shifted against the Republican Congress. Corruption scandals began to emerge, rocking the GOP. Tom DeLay was forced to resign after being indicted on corruption charges. Several other Republicans were also indicted or charged or uh, convicted. The Democrats would still run from any mention of the war in Iraq. Republicans would run around, probably remember this, cut and run. Everything was cut and run. The Democrats would say, we don't want to cut and run. Don Kerry said that, I don't want to cut and run. It didn't matter that the war was opposed by a vast majority of the American people. Democrats could not overcome their ingrained fear on the issue. Nothing could shake them from it. So that was our next task. 
we would move and prove to the Democrats that the issue mattered to Americans and that it was a political winner. And we did so in Connecticut. In the 2006 elections, Joel Lieberman was the strongest Iraq war hawk in the Democratic caucus, constantly undermining Democrats on the issue. Undermining Democrats on a lot of issues. So we targeted him in the primary, and we won that one. Lieberman would go on to win the general election as an independent, but the message had been sent. The war matters, and elections would be won or lost on the issue. This stiffened Democratic backs, and running on Iraq, we headed into 2006 with the win of our backs. Republican corruption was front page news. The war was a disaster. Bush's approval ratings were in the gutter. The economy was beginning to slow. Democrats were achieving money parity with their Republican counterparts at first. And most importantly, Democrats were starting to run as Democrats. In 2003, Howard Dean had lit up the Democratic primary by promising to represent the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. It was such an incredibly radical notion. By 2006, most Democrats were running as members of the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. Still, the task was difficult. Democrats needed 15 seats to take control of the House and six for the Senate. That surely couldn't happen. In fact, since 1994, when the Republicans picked up 54 seats, we just see a few seats change each cycle. You know, two, this one, five, that one. We were a 50-50 nation, and we had scientifically gerrymandered our, our uh, congressional districts to protect the incumbent parties. And while Democrats held dozens of seats in so-called red districts, those that were won by George Bush, there were only a handful of Republican seats representing a handful of Republicans representing blue ones. The election prognosticators uh, predicted maybe a dozen Democratic House pickups, maybe two or three in the Senate. Instead, we found out that running as Democrats, people would respond, and that we were not a conservative nation that voters would respond to a message of change if given a clear alternative. By the time the smoke cleared that election night, Democrats had picked up 30 seats in the House and an impossible six seats in the Senate. Democrats now control both chambers. Two years later, now, today, the climate is even more toxic for Republicans, if that can be believed. We're already experiencing uh, extremely competitive races in six Senate uh, uh, states, Alaska, New Hampshire, Virginia, New Mexico, Colorado, and Minnesota. Virginia and New Mexico, actually, are pretty much in the bag. We're going to pick those two up. There are at least, at least six other states that could develop into competitive races. In the House, we're looking at at least 60, 60, 60 solid pickup opportunities pick up of another 30 seats as possible. In fact, many of you probably know that we just picked up, that Democrats just picked up a solid, solidly Republican district formerly held by Speaker of the House Dennis Hastert in a special election last month just west of here. This was a district that Bush carried by double digits in 2004, with the Democratic candidate running on Iraq and the Constitution, won it solidly by about six points. If Democrats were to win every seat that is less Republican than that Dennis Castro's, they would pick up 40 seats. That won't happen, probably. But there are plenty, plenty of targets. Some of them are even more Republican than Castro's own district. Down in Louisiana right now, there's a special election that Republicans are talking about publicly abandoning. It was a seat that George Bush won by 20 points and Republicans don't think they can compete. On top of everything, both House Republicans and Senate Republicans are broke. Democrats have incredible amounts of money. Republicans don't. They just don't have the money to defend the seats that they need to defend. And then there's the White House. I suspect when we get to the question and answer period, most of you, most of you will want to talk about the White House. I won't really get into it now. But suffice it to say, Democrats have the energy the issues, the public sentiment, the better candidate, and far more money than anything John McCain can ever, ever hope for. 
It won't be an easy battle. But as long as Democrats do what they need to do, Barack Obama will be the next president of the United States. Now, let's not forget that Democrats are getting a big assist this year from Republicans who remain as corrupt, as ineffective, tone deaf, and out of touch as they were in 2006. If the GOP was even a smidgen more effective, their advantages in their infrastructure, in their machine, their think tanks, Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, their ground game would far outclass anything that Democrats have. We're starting to build our own infrastructure as, as progressives, but we have a long way to go to match what the Republicans have. But Democrats are making inroads by refusing to run away from what originally made them Democrats. Regardless of what conservatives say, the American people still believe that government has a role to play in making our lives better. They've seen over the last eight years a party in the Republicans that claims that government can do no good. Therefore, he can't possibly run a government that does good. That's why George Bush appointed a horse lawyer to, to leave FEMA. And he appointed somebody who knew what he or she was doing and had that person effectively managed the aftermath of the Katrina disaster, that people might have thought, well, government can make our lives better. And that would have done Republicans no good. Regardless of what conservatives say, the American people still believe that this is a nation of immigrants, that we are compassionate, and that we are stronger because of the new blood that constantly refreshes our culture. Republicans thought that they had a great issue on immigration. They weren't, good mileage, they weren't getting good mileage anymore on hating on African Americans, gays, San Francisco, New York, Hollywood, Muslims, the North. So, <laughs> they thought they had a great new one. They could hate on brown people. That would do the trick. Unfortunately, that has backfired disastrously. Not only has the broader public rejected anti-immigration sentiment that we've seen as an election, 2006 and 2007, and even in Dennis Hatcher's old seat. But the Latino vote, which is the nation's largest swing demographic, has now aligned itself solidly with the Democratic Party for the first time. Given that it, it's also the fastest growing demographic in this nation, that this portends quite poorly for Republicans, not just this year, for at least another generation to come. Regardless of what conservatives say, the American people want government programs like S-CHIP, a health insurance plan for low to middle income children. Bush vetoed this bill twice last year, and Republicans in Congress worked very, very hard to make sure both those vetoes were upheld. They worked tirelessly to ensure that children would not receive quality health care. They know the issue is politically disastrous for them in the short term. They know this will be used against them this fall. They know they're going to lose races on that issue. But they know that if the American people realize that government can be a force for good and help people, they are destroyed forever as an ideology. So better to suffer the short-term damage by opposing that chip than risk long-term annihilation by letting it through. Regardless of what conservatives say, the American people still want out of Iraq. The search hasn't worked. Just the last few days, we've lost 10 good men, 10 good Americans in that country. McCain may want to stay in Iraq for 100 years, but the, Amer but the American people don't. As a result, Democrats are poised to make big gains on that issue alone this November. Barack Obama will have an unprecedented opportunity in the next two years to redirect our nation toward a more progressive future. We'll have the White House. We'll have a solid Senate majority with even more favorable Senate map in 2010. We may, in 2011, actually have a filibuster-proof majority. And we should have a 40- to 60-seat majority in the House. This is what our future holds, or what it should hold, but only if we work hard to make it happen. Only if we engage, only if we keep organizing and spreading the word. Every vote in every state will matter. Every single race. Just north of here, Democrats have a fantastic House opportunity with Dan Seals, who's running against uh, Republican incumbent Mark Kirk. Big, big warmonger. We have a chance. There will be no excuse for anybody, 
anywhere to sit this one out. The stakes are high, but the reward, rewards will be higher than any progressive has ever dreamed of, even just a few years ago. Certainly, more so than Tom Delay and his permanent Republican majority. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions.